Uh, and now it is my great and enormous pleasure to introduce the speaker, our speaker for this evening, uh, President, no, former President, David Hollinger of the OAH. Uh, I, I want to begin my comments by saying that one of the joys of this association is that of the community it constructs among its members. And for me, one of the real pleasures of serving on the board for the past several years and now succeeding David as president has been getting to know David Hollinger. Uh, it has been a source of, he has been a source of great strength for the association, but he's also been the source of a surprising new friendship for which I want to say a very personal thank you. David Hollinger, just who belongs together with whom and for what purposes and on what authority? That's the sentence with which David Hollinger, Preston Hotchkiss, Professor of American History at the University of California, Berkeley, begins his provocative collection of essays, Cosmopolitanism and Solidarity. Open up almost any one of David's half a dozen major books or glance at the first paragraph of one of his countless essays and you will be immediately hooked. For David has consistently turned his attention to asking about the historical meanings behind the issues in which we are all enmeshed, not only as historians, but as teachers and citizens as well. David Hollinger's presidency now of the Organization of American Historians reminds us all of one of the important roles of historians in our society, that of the public intellectual. The trajectory of David's career suggests a deep and abiding commitment to exploring the history of ideas that frame and guide our lives. Beginning with his early work on the philosopher of science, Morris Cohen, David moved into larger questions about the role of science in culture. His early essays and his work on Robert Oppenheimer sought to understand the role of scientific thought in shaping standards for inquiry that fostered skeptical thought and laid the groundwork for liberal democracy. From there, it was a short step to examining the role of religion and the divisive as well as the unifying values of faith. These in turn led him to explore the place of Jews and Judaism in harnessing the power of scientific thought to the purposes of American society. But questions about a particular faith proved secondary to David's abiding concern to discover how religion in general and some religions in particular and circle their adherence with a sense of solidarity. How, he has asked most recently, has solidarity been constructed? How have Americans imagined themselves as part of a collective enterprise? David has confronted these questions in books like, the, like In the American Province, Studies in the History and Historiography of Ideas, Post-Ethnic America, beyond multiculturalism and science, Jews, and secular culture. But much of his recent work appears in publications like the London Review of Books, Callaloo, and Daedalus, where they leap the academic walls to reach the larger marketplace of ideas. David's gift for constructing eloquent and evocative sentences wielding just the right phrase at the right moment has made many of these pieces the focus of debate. Historians have learned to think beyond skin, sorry, beyond skin color and natal origins to communities of faith and communities of descent. We've been encouraged to ponder more deeply the demographic sources and consequences of a religion, of a rigid ethno-racial pentagon of classifications used by the American government. And the verdant branches of American intellectual history that David has done so much to develop 
enable us to comprehend what David calls the one hate rule. In a recent essay in Daedalus, David challenged his readers to reconcile what he called a discursive Grand Canyon between those who deployed words like post-racial and those who demanded evidence of their immediate relevance. David Hollinger's probing questions have served the historical profession and the OAH brilliantly. We honor David this evening for his scholarly work and for the clear thinking and dispassionate temperament that have skillfully led us through this past year. I give you David Hollinger. The life of human beings today is cast in a multicultural context, wrote the great comparativist Wilfred Cantwell Smith in 1960. <clears throat> Every community on earth is becoming a minority in a complexity of diverse groups, he continued. In this age of minorities, no particular we can any longer claim credibly superiority to any they. The most defensible solidarity is now humanity itself, insisted Smith, who then identified Christians, <coughs> capitalists, communists, and Muslims as prominent minorities slow to recognize their true status. It was especially important, <coughs> he, assisted, he asserted, to get this truth across to white people and Westerners who seem almost incapable of adjusting themselves to a new world in which they too are minorities. For Smith, the recognition of the diversity of the human species and the diminution of inequalities within it were bound up with one another. These ideas <clears throat> resonate well with the multiculturalist initiatives of the 1990s and even more resoundingly with the whites are a minority exclamations of the 2000s. That these observations were offered with such urgency 50 years ago, and in the pages of the Christian century by one of the period's most respected ecumenical Protestants, can flag for us the role that ecumenical Protestants played in diminishing Anglo-Protestant prejudice and embracing the varieties of humankind. <clears throat> Recognizing this role can lead us in turn to an understanding of the dialectical process by which ecumenical Protestants lost their numbers and their influence in public affairs, while evangelical Protestants increased theirs. Politically and theologically conservative evangelicals flourished while continuing to espouse popular ideas about the nation and the world that were criticized and abandoned by liberalizing, diversity-accepting ecumenists. Appreciating the significance of this Protestant dialectic within which the two great rivals for control of the symbolic capital of Christianity defined themselves in terms of each other, can then yield a more comprehensive and accurate account of the place in modern American history of the so-called Protestant establishment. We now have an extensive and increasingly helpful literature on evangelical Protestantism in the 20th century, but studies of ecumenical Protestantism remain fewer in number, narrower in scope, and lower in professional visibility. I refer to ecumenical Protestantism because this label has proven to be the least confusing way to distinguish the family of Protestants of which I speak from the fundamentalist, Pentecostal, holiness, and other conservative persuasions that came to be described collectively as evangelical, even though the latter term had earlier denoted a much greater range of Protestant orientations. This distinction <clears throat> between ecumenicals and evangelicals hardened during the 1940s and after as a result of the discomfort felt especially by fundamentalists with how far the mainstream liberals pushed their program of cooperation across denominational lines and of alliances with non-Protestant, non-Christian, and eventually secular parties. Indeed, it was opposition to this program that most united the fundamentalists with other conservative Protestants, enabling them to form the commodious religious expanse known since the 1940s as evangelical Protestantism. 
While the ecumenists increasingly define themselves through a sympathetic exploration of wider worlds, the evangelicals consolidated home truths and sought to spread them throughout the world. The ecumenical Protestant <clears throat> encounter with diversity built in a fashion on the ancient myth of Pentecost. Members of every tribe and nation addressed each other with cloven tongues of fire, according to the second chapter of Acts, <clears throat> hearing each other as if all were speaking in the hearer's own language. For the particular subset of evangelicals called Pentecostals, with whom the scripture is the most identified, what mattered was the spiritual intensity of the moment, the recreating of the immediate experience of this unity of the varieties of humankind. Fellowship across the various divisions was to be achieved through a charismatic engagement with the gospel in which everyone could share. For ecumenists, however, the big issue was what happens next? After the cloven tongues of fire, have shown the possibility for a species-wide solidarity. How do you institutionalize that solidarity? Beyond mystical moments, <clears throat> how can one diminish social divisions in the long run in the course of earthly life day after day? The ecumenists were more institutional builders than, than revivalists, more devoted to creating and maintaining communities than to facilitating a close relationship with the divine, and more frankly concerned with social welfare than with the state of the individual soul. Evangelicals could be institution builders too, but the solidarities the evangelicals sought to institutionalize were more particularistic. The ecumenicals were preoccupied with mobilizing massive constituencies to address social evils. They wanted to reformulate the gospel in terms sufficiently broad to enable people of many cultures and social stations to appreciate its value. They sought to overcome the curse of Babel, <clears throat> not in fleeting moments of ecstasy, but in the prosaic routines of daily life. Surely we are now tempted to protest. The doings of all these Presbyterians all these white Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists and Congregationalists and Lutherans and Episcopalians, surely this could not have mattered that much. In response to this intuition, <clears throat> it helps to remember that ecumenical Protestantism was anything but marginal to American life in the mid-century decades. The population of the United States remained, after all, overwhelmingly white Protestant. Membership in the major classical denominations was at an all-time high. Persons at least nominally affiliated with these denominations controlled all branches of the federal government and most of the business world, as well as the nation's chief cultural and educational institutions, and of course countless state and local institutions. If you were in charge of something big before 1960, <clears throat> chances are you grew up in a white Protestant milieu. Until the 1970s, moreover, the public face of Protestantism itself remained that of the politically and theologically liberal ecumenists of the National Council of Churches and its pre-1950 predecessor, the Federal Council of Churches. Only later did the more conservative Protestants of the National Association of Evangelicals, an organization founded in 1942 in explicit opposition to the ecumenists, gain the public standing it enjoys today. The evangelicals gradually became the dominant face of Protestantism, moreover, <clears throat> partly because they continued for many decades to espouse a number of diversity-resisting perspectives that remained popular with the white public, even as these perspectives were being renounced by self-interrogating ecumenist intellectuals like Wilfred Cantwell Smith. This mood of self-interrogation demands emphasis. One of the most neglected features of 20th century American history is the intensity and range of the self-critique carried out by the intellectual leadership of mainstream liberal Protestantism during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. The critical revision of inherited traditions was no monopoly of such people, to be sure, but they made a great production of attacking the ethnocentrism and sectarianism they professed to find all around them, including in their own churches. While evangelical leaders were trying to build up pride in themselves and were protesting against the patronizing and dismissive remarks often made about evangelicals by elite intellectuals, religious and secular, many ecumenical leaders were giving themselves hell. When historians treat the growth of evangelicalism in a religious vacuum, attending to the social, structural, political and popular cultural conditions and neglecting the religious, 
They miss the historical process by which religious liberals abandoned a series of diversity resisting ideas and practices only to find these same ideas and practices serving as a vital foundation for the growth in public standing of evangelical Protestantism. What happened to <clears throat> ecumenical Protestantism during the crisis of the 1960s and its aftermath, I will argue in this address, can be instructively compared to what happened simultaneously to the Democratic Party in national politics. We have lost the South for a generation, President Lyndon Johnson is widely quoted as having said <clears throat> on behalf of the Democratic Party in 1964 when the Democrats aligned themselves with the cause of civil rights for African Americans. What ecumenical Protestant leaders did is not quite the same, but there is a parallel, as I will show. <clears throat> Among the most important of the popular diversity-resisting perspectives, abandoned by the ecumenicals but cherished and defended by evangelicals, was the claim that Christians, especially Protestants, had a proprietary relation to the American nation that could be easily exercised despite the constitutional separation of church and state. The notion of a Christian America remained popular in evangelical circles long after the ecumenical leadership put itself at risk by renouncing this long crucial foundation for its own authority in public affairs. The self-interrogative mood of the ecumenists was well caught in specific relation to this disputed notion of a Christian America by one of the editors of the Christian Century in 1961. Martin Marty asked <coughs> that the inauguration <coughs> of the Catholic John F. Kennedy as president be treated as the end of Protestantism as a national religion and its advent as the distinctive faith of a creative minority. The acceptance of Catholics as full partners in the nation was a striking step. The Protestant establishment had long been vocally, if not vehemently, anti-Catholic. Indeed, the ecumenical movement was intensified in the 1940s and 1950s by the fear that Protestant disunity and Catholic unity would lead to a Catholic takeover of the country. These guys were so paranoid, they imagined there would come a time when there would be six Catholics on the Supreme Court. <clears throat> <laughs> this suspicion was rendered credible by the slowness of the Catholic hierarchy to accept the wisdom of the pluralistic attitude toward religion that ecumenists and their Jewish allies espoused, and that was later put in place by Vatican II and by the great American Jesuit politician and theorist, John Courtney Murray. But at issue for Marty in 1961 was not only the acceptance at long last of Catholics into full and equal partnership as Americans, Marty also explicitly recognized Jewish and secular voices as genuinely constituent parts of American life. The notion of a Protestant nation was being renounced, and so too the notion of a Christian nation and even of a religious nation. Marty's outlook was far indeed from that of evangelicals at the time. This point requires underscoring because in later decades, evangelicals joined forces ecumenically with many Catholic and Jewish organizations in opposition to abortion, in support of Israel, and in other common causes. <clears throat> in the context of this recent history, the positions taken by evangelical leaders in the 1950s and 1960s are easily lost from view. Even after John F. Kennedy had won the bulk of ecumenical leaders with his famous church-state separation speech before several hundred ministers here in Houston, the National Association of Evangelicals expressed alarm that with the possible election of a Catholic, the United States will no longer be recognized as a Protestant nation in the eyes of the world. The National Association of Evangelicals, which only a few years before had actually campaigned to amend the federal constitution to include the sentence, this nation devoutly recognizes the authority and law of Jesus Christ, savior and ruler of nations, through whom we are bestowed the blessings of almighty God. The National Association did not formally endorse Richard Nixon's candidacy, but there was no doubt where it stood. <clears throat> The national office actually coordinated special election targeted prayers in evangelical churches throughout the country to be offered every Sunday prior to the November election. Disagreements about the place of Christianity in America parallel disagreements about the relation of Christianity to human rights globally. 
While the ecumenists were proud of having played a role in advancing a human rights agenda within the United Nations and had no trouble recognizing that the diversity of the UN's constituencies made it inappropriate to predicate human rights on a narrowly Christian foundation, evangelicals castigated the UN's Declaration of Human Rights because in the words of Christianity Today editor Carl F. H. Henry in 1957, the Declaration incorporates no references to a supernatural creator, nor does it anywhere assert that God endows mankind with rights. Marty speculated that with withdrawal from the traditional idea of a Christian nation and from the picture of the entire human species in a Protestant self-image, he speculated that this might enable Protestants to find in their new modesty a measure of self-respect based on a confident and accurate understanding of their situation. But Marty worried that <clears throat> the orgies of public scourging and self-examination had taken the Protestant principle of self-critique to masochistic extremes. But the spasms of self-flagellation were far from over, and they constitute a portentous episode in the history of Protestantism in the United States. Collective self-criticism soon accelerated, became more strident, and spread across a greater expanse of issues. Two books of 1964 illustrate the intensity and direction of this episode and the centrality to it of the challenge of recognizing and accepting diversity. One such book is William Stringfellow's My People is the Enemy. This book was written by an Episcopalian layman who had spent <clears throat> seven years living in poverty in Harlem while serving as a lawyer to indigent black people. This book excoriated American churches for not responding more aggressively to the evils of racism and not accepting black people more fully. The churches of white society in America have largely forfeited any claim to leadership in diminishing these evils, Stringfellow complained while offering page after page of searing testimony of how a truly Christian approach, as he understood it, would engage a color-defined population still not incorporated as fully American. The second book, Ralph E. Dodge's The Unpopular Missionary, was written by a senior Methodist missionary to Angola and Rhodesia, indeed a bishop. This book pushed with novel passion and urgency the complaint that missions had been too closely connected to colonialism and had tried to impose on indigenous peoples denominational distinctions that made no sense abroad. By failing to turn more control and resources over to the indigenous churches of Africa, India, and other missions fields, Dodge warned, American and European missionary projects were doomed to, the way, to go the way of colonial governments, out for good and for the same reasons. The basic problem, Dodge explained, <clears throat> was that the missionary project was still too slow and tepid in accepting indigenous peoples as human beings, as full brothers in Jesus Christ on their own terms, not simply as copies of Christians in Memphis and Minneapolis. Stringfellow's exploration of domestic American racism and Dodge's commentary on missionary colonialism sharpened themes in ecumenical Protestant self-critique that were already well established by the early 1960s. <clears throat> Other voices pushed that self-critique in directions that were more novel, that distinguished the ecumenical discourse more starkly from evangelical discourse, and that embraced more omnivorously the diversity of the world beyond white Protestantism. Two additional books of the same historical moment can represent these more radical voices that question even the foundations left unchallenged by Stringfellow and Dodge. Honest to God was written in England by an Anglican bishop, but it gained enormous notoriety in the United States from the moment of its publication in 1963. John A.T. Robinson attacked as hopelessly anachronistic the ideas about God and Jesus that were common among Christians, mocking the supernaturalism that suggests that Jesus was really God Almighty walking around on earth dressed up as a man taking part in a game of charades. Robinson's breakaway bestseller popularized as never before the strivings of a theological elite to update Christian teachings in relation to contemporary culture and modern notions of cognitive plausibility. For a prominent cleric to characterize as downright dishonest the sincere God talk of the average churchgoer, 
um, serve to expose, as never before, the gap between the people in the pew on the one hand and the increasingly cosmopolitan church leadership on the other. Taking to a new extreme the classical impulse in religious liberalism to engage the world rather than to withdraw from it, Robinson dramatically legitimized the diverse world of contemporary culture as an arena for sympathetic engagement. Indeed, prior to writing Honest to God, Bishop Robinson was best known for having testified in court against the sexually repressive censorship of D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. Robinson <clears throat> made the generic ideal of honesty rather than any specifically Christian doctrine the touchstone for his testimony and he blurred the line between most, what most people thought Christianity was and the rest of modern life. A young Baptist seminarian, Harvey Cox, blurred this line more purposefully in 1965 in The Secular City. Cox's manifesto proposed a politically engaged religion organized around human responsibility for the destiny of a world that many Christians wrongly assumed to be in God's hands. The book soon sold more than a million copies. Cox celebrated secularization <clears throat> as a liberation from all supernatural myths and sacred symbols while insisting that God was no less present throughout secular domains than within what traditionalists called religion, Cox concluded iconoclastically that the very name of God was so misleading that it might be well to stop even mentioning God until our worldly experience gives us a new vocabulary. Like Moses, he wrote in the book's concluding sentence, let us be confident that we will be granted a new name by the events of the future. But for now, we must simply take up the work of liberating the captives. Central to Cox's contrast between religion and the new secular field for spiritual striving was the inability of the provincial Christian to deal with the wider world that the theologians had come to master. <clears throat> Secularization took place only when the cosmopolitan confrontations of city life exposed the relativity of the myths and traditions once thought to be unquestionable. Convinced of the virtues of heterogeneity and of the color and character lent by diversity, Cox pressed the case for pluralism and tolerance throughout the world, but especially in the United States, where the recent emancipation of Catholics, Jews, and others had come away from an, a forced Protestant cultural religion. All this bode well, he said, for further diversification. Countless symposia wondered just where this book's line of analysis might lead. <clears throat> might it lead outside the faith? Ecumenical leaders had been railing against secularism throughout the 1940s and 50s. Cox created such a stir because he broke so decisively and bluntly with this deeply entrenched practice. Moreover, the secular city appeared right in the middle of the civil rights era when vehicles other than the church presented themselves as more rapid and maneuverable means of advancing causes to which the ecumenical leadership was committed. In that same year of 1965, the Mississippi Catholic writer Walker Percy lamented, <clears throat> lamented that it was not the Christian who most often did what most needed to be done on the white side of the color line. This contribution was instead made most conspicuously by the liberal humanist. The people who actually taught the ignorant, fed the hungry, and went to jail with the imprisoned, observed Percy, were more likely than not to be Sarah Lawrence sociology majors. <clears throat> Agnostic Jewish social workers like Mickey Schwerner, campus existentialists, and others sent from the Berkeley-Cambridge axis. <laughs> to, be sure, <clears throat> to be sure, the National Council of Churches had been among the sponsors of Freedom Summer in 1964, and there had been a small but steady stream of northern liberal clerics and laypersons in Martin Luther King's demonstrations. Percy underestimated the role of ecumenical Protestants in the civil rights movement. But if one were looking in the mid-1960s for ways to liberate the captives, as Cox had called upon Christians to do, and if one was now authorized to apply oneself to that task without any God talk, one could find, quickly, secular organizations like the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that were trying to do just that. 
The secular liberators of the Berkeley-Cambridge axis were not encumbered, moreover, as were the National Council of Churches and its denominational affiliates by a reluctant rank and file who paid the bills and who sometimes listened to the complaints of increasingly vocal evangelicals to the effect that the ecumenical elite was selling out true religion for social activism. The expanding gap <clears throat> between the leadership and the church-going laity of the mainstream denominations demands closer attention because this gap, as it widened during the crisis of the 1960s, became the demographic and doctrinal matrix for the rise to political prominence of conservative-leaning evangelical Protestants and the loss by the old Protestant establishment to secular enterprises of some of the energies that had made it a formidable presence in American life. The complacency of the ecumenical leaders rendered them more comfortable with rigorous self-interrogation, yet slow to see the risks to their institutional standing that this self-interrogation entailed. The gap was defined by the leadership's increasing engagement with national and international issues of less interest to rank-and-file churchgoers whose concerns were centered on their own congregations. The classic local cosmopolitan tension between pulpit and pew <clears throat> between seminary and congregation had long been a feature of Protestant life. But by the 1940s, several generations of missionary activity had populated the governing boards of many denominations and of many inter interdenominational service organizations like the YMCA and the YWCA with internationally conscious when and men and women convinced that the denominational distinctions were being rendered increasingly anachronistic by cross-cultural contact. Meeting the challenge of a culturally diverse world demanded a focus on essentials. Hence an energetic but decidedly top-down movement pushed not only for further cooperation between denominations at home, but for a world organization that would unite American Protestants with those of Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The establishing of a World Council of Churches, originally planned for the 1930s, was delayed by World War II, but in 1948, the World Council became a reality. <clears throat> it was dominated by Americans, who then campaigned earnestly through publications, sermons, and study conferences to educate their own constituencies with the need to supplement a local with a global perspective. In the meantime, American entry into World War II generated a new and concentrated effort to outline what church leaders described as the Christian basis for a just, equitable, and peaceful future. They agreed upon a program of political action that focused on the United Nations and on the diminution of racial and economic inequalities in the United States. <clears throat> this ambitious program was developed and adopted by study conferences of several hundred church leaders convened by the Federal Council of Churches in 1942 and 1945 with the support of nearly every prominent figure in the Protestant establishment of that era, including John Foster Dulles, who was the chief mover behind both of these conclaves. The resolutions of these conferences called for the self-government of all colonial peoples, insisted that the United States could not play a productive role abroad until racial discrimination was ended within American borders, advocated experimentation with non-capitalist forms of economic organization, <clears throat> encouraged some form of world government as the only viable antidote to the evils of nationalism, and endorsed the basic principles of Franklin Roosevelt when he enunciated the Economic Bill of Rights during the 1944 State of the Union message. These assembled bishops, seminary presidents, church officials, and famous preachers did not agree on everything, some of them, most conspicuously Dulles, soon pulled away from the political orientation that was put in place at these conferences of the early 1940s. <clears throat> but the FCC and the officials of all the affiliated denominational bodies, along with the Christian Century, the house organ of the Protestant establishment, entered the post-war world publicly committed to causes that were understood in contemporary American politics as liberal, if not radical. Time magazine characterized the resolutions as sensational in their degree of radicalism. It would be a mistake to exaggerate what these ecumenical Protestants actually accomplished in diminishing white racism, yet it would also be a mistake to ignore what they did because in the 1940s, <clears throat> even 
modest gestures distinguished the FCC from most other groups of empowered white Americans. The huge study conferences of 1942 and 1945 were held in integrated Ohio cities only after, the count, after council officials had tried and repeatedly failed to get assurances from hotel owner associations in Detroit and other cities that their black delegates would not be obliged to stay in segregated hotels. Very few national organizations of remotely the size of the FCC were then refusing to convene in cities where their black participants would be humiliated. The OAH, then the Mississippi Valley Historical Association, did not take this stand until 1952 when Merle Curdy refused to deliver his presidential address unless the convention were moved out of New Orleans. The integrationist agenda of the Protestant establishment in the 1940s was more talk than action. But some talk <clears throat> approached eloquence. Especially important in this respect were the essays and editorials in Christian Century, which was the leading national magazine to protest against the internment of Japanese Americans as a racist violation of American constitutional principles. Further, there issued from the Methodist and Congregationalist seminaries of the period a series of forceful, analytically ambitious, anti-racist treatises. Among these were Edwin D. Soper's Racism, A World Issue, and Buell G. Gallagher's Color and Conscience, The Irrepressible Conflict, two of the most searching and extensively developed critiques of racism written by any institutionally prominent white American at any time prior to the 1960s. Gallagher, <clears throat> anticipating a style later practiced more sharply by Stringfellow, castigated his fellow churchmen for failing to develop measures to combat Jim Crow remotely as forceful and effective as those implemented by the Communist Party of the United States. Gallagher's respectful reference to the communists can remind us that the ecumenists whose story I am telling were far from alone in engaging diversity and in trying to diminish group-specific inequality. Prominent among the other agents of change <clears throat> were three that are extensively studied. The organized pursuit of civil rights by church-centered African Americans, the propagation of cultural relativism by social scientific intellectuals, and the egalitarian of the most radical of the labor unions, including those with Communist Party leadership. Many of the relevant movements were decidedly secular in orientation and had a heavily Jewish demographic base. The significance of these well-recognized movements need not be diminished in order to register the role of ecumenical Protestantism. But I'm less concerned to measure the relative influence of these various movements than to explain the role that diversity issues played within American Protestantism and to show how the willingness of the ecumenical leadership to take chances with its constituency about these issues created space for the eventual triumph of the religious right. <clears throat> Hence it is crucial to understand at the various initiatives of the ecumenists I have mentioned, all of which seem so mild from today's perspective, carried the ecumenical leadership quite far out in front of the average Methodist and Presbyterian. Just how far did not become evident until the 1960s, when social scientific surveys, as well as daily experience in the denominational trenches concerning civil rights, feminism, sex, and Vietnam, made the gap impossible to miss. The crisis of the 1960s was all the more severe because church leaders did not see it coming. Two conditions of the 1940s and 50s had enabled them to underestimate the width and depth of the gap between themselves and their constituents. One condition was the sheer increase in numbers. New sanctuaries and Christian education units were financed and built in suburbs all over the country. Churches of all kinds were popular with community, were popular community institutions with the parents of the baby boomers, especially in an atmosphere when Religion in general was widely praised in contrast to godless communism. A second condition fostering complacency was the Protestant establishment's high standing in Washington and in the national media. This status followed in large part from the strong class position of the segment of society found in the mainstream churches. Harry Emerson Fosdick's national radio pulpit dominated Sunday morning broadcasting because the Federal Communications Commission deferred to the educated, socially prominent, ecumenical establishment. Yet from the late 1940s onward, the Protestant establishment was subject to increasingly pointed and well-organized attacks from the political right, especially from evangelicals. Evangelicals mobilized <clears throat> against the United Nations 
and were hostile toward ecumenicals for the latter's enthusiastic support of it. When the Congress was considering a resolution calling for the strengthening of the UN in 1947, the National Association of Evangelicals demanded instead that Congress resolve to support and strengthen Christian missionary endeavors throughout the world. A vibrant world Christianity, not compromise and accommodation with diversity, was the answer to the globe's problems. Carl McIntyre, a New Jersey radio preacher with a large national following, declared the National Council of Churches to be an ally of Russia. In 1953, McIntyre distributed a pamphlet entitled Bishop Oxnum, Prophet of Marx, aimed at G. Bromley Oxnum, then president of both the National Council and the World Council of Churches. As a result of such accusations, Oxnum testified before the House on American Activities Committee to defend himself against charges of communist sympathies. Just prior to Oxnum's hearing, <clears throat> The National Association of Evangelicals, despite its ambivalence toward McIntyre's florid and demographic style, passed a resolution supporting government investigations into the political loyalty of church officials. Even within the denominational bodies identified with ecumenical outlooks, programs of egalitarian outreach, outreach were subject to severe attacks. The Methodist Federation for Social Action a large national body led by liberal bishops and seminary deans was condemned in a widely circulated pamphlet, Is There a Pink Fringe in the Methodist Church? <clears throat> this pamphlet of 1951 was produced by a Houston-based group called the Committee for the Preservation of Methodism. The tract described the social action organization as claiming to be Christian, but actually serving as a propaganda vehicle for spreading communist ideas. What the authors of this pamphlet offered as evidence for this charge is an index of how wide the range of their complaints and of the centrality to these complaints of diversity issues. The allegedly nefarious activities of the Social Action Methodists, including their asking for a stronger civil rights section of the Department of Justice, their favoring an end to economic, political, and military support of colonial regimes, their calling for the repeal of the Oriental Exclusion Act, <clears throat> their call for the diplomatic recognition of China, and their commitment to social economic planning to develop a society without class or, or group discrimination or privileges. Among the Presbyterians, the most prominent target was Princeton Theological Seminary President John A. Mackay, perhaps the most influential Presbyterian in the world, with the exception of Dulles. Mackay's <clears throat> early 1950s advocacy of the diplomatic recognition of the People's Republic of China considerably fattened his file as kept by the House on American Activities Committee a copy of which was secretly passed to an evangelical leader looking for ammunition to use against Mackay. The person who requested and obtained Mackay's file from a right-wing congressman was fundamentalist firebrand L. Nelson Bell, who was the father-in-law of evangelist Billy Graham. Bell and Graham <clears throat> were the major forces behind the launching in 1956 of Christianity Today, the magazine designed to counter Christian century. The new magazine was financed by Sun Oil Company magnate <clears throat> J. Howard Pugh after the National Council of Churches repeatedly refused his demands that it repudiate its liberal political positions. Christianity Today's founding editor, Carl F. H. Henry, proved to be a relentless scourge of the ecumenists. In 1959, <clears throat> he attributed communist affiliations to 105 of the 237 clergy recently assembled by the National Council of Churches to address foreign policy issues. J. Edgar Hoover's warnings about communist subversion in ecumenical churches appeared regularly in Christianity Today. Bell was also representative of the large segment of white Southern uh, pr Protestantism that was ambivalent, if not hostile, toward the 1954 Brown v. School Board decision of the United States Supreme Court. <clears throat> Immediately after this decision, Bell published an article referring to oh, Bell published an, uh, an article referring to the barriers of race having been established by God, and declared his sympathy for individuals whom he described as the finest Christians in the world, who believe that it is unchristian to force away God-created barriers. Now, to be sure, Bell and Graham 
fought against the most entrenched segregationists of their milieu. Graham insisted that his own rallies be racially integrated. But the voices of Bell and Graham, like so many other evangelicals, routinely condemned racism only in its capacity as an individual sin, not in its capacity as a civic evil to be overcome by the actions of government authority. The Christian century <clears throat> returned the hostile favors of Christianity today. The pages of both magazines display the mutual annoyance that marked this often bitter rivalry. A widely noted and emblematic episode in this quarrel was the refusal of Reinhold Niebuhr to even meet with Billy Graham at the time of Graham's enormously successful crusade in New York in 1957. <clears throat> Niebuhr accused Graham of holding obscurantist views of religious doctrine and of playing to the most childlike emotions of the faithful. <clears throat> Niebuhr wrote in the pages of Life magazine of Graham's pathetic narrowness of view. Graham cannot, <clears throat> Graham cannot speak to anyone who is aware of the continuing possibilities of good and evil in every advance of civilization, every discipline of culture, every religious convention, Niebuhr declared. Evangelicals did not appreciate being treated as ignorant country bumpkins by these elite ecumenists. Yet the frequency and intensity of criticism led the ecumenists to hold back. The most thorough historian of the civil rights activities of the National Council, James F. Findlay, Jr., concludes that its leaders were intimidated throughout the 1950s and very early 1960s by these attacks. <clears throat> Only in 1963, the year in which the Christian century published King's letter from the Birmingham jail, did ecumenical leaders return to the level of anti-racist engagement they had displayed in the 1940s. 1963 proved to be late in the day. Shortly after the ecumenical leadership renewed and intensified its anti-racist program, national conflicts over civil rights, feminism, sex, and Vietnam produced the crisis that ended the Protestant establishment, diminished the authority of all of its constituent denominational bodies, and paved the way for the triumph of the evangelicals. These escalating conflicts <clears throat> not only exposed at last the gap between the leadership of the churchgoers, but created a new challenge. While these church leaders were trying to bring the people in the pews up to speed, the leaders were rapidly left behind by the highly articulate minority <clears throat> who gravitated toward the Berkeley-Cambridge axis because they found the churches too moderate and clunky in the task of liberating the captives. But for some Protestants, the established leadership was going too far too fast. Those white Protestants, less concerned to liberate the captives, were able to find religious cover in the increased credibility of evangelical claims to speak for American Christianity. <clears throat> Two decades of concerted effort by the increasingly media-savvy evangelicals had placed before the public a face of Christianity very different from that displayed by Harry Emerson Fosdick and the Christian Century. In addition to Christianity Today and the National Association of Evangelicals, the, uh, evangel uh, the uh, evangelicals created Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena and developed an extensive network of radio and television ministries. <clears throat> Upwardly mobile Seventh-day Adventist and Church of the Nazarene congregants, whom a generation earlier were joining the more respectable Methodists and Presbyterians, now had better reason to stay put. Unlike in the past, they now saw the churches of their nativity recognized as real on television and radio and in national politics. And one could be now comfortably <clears throat> and confidently Christian without taking on the social obligations the ecumenical leaders insisted were incumbent upon any authentic Christian witness in the circumstances of the times. From the middle years of the 1960s onward, all of the mainline denominations experienced a precipitous drop in numbers. Part of this decline followed from the diminished migration from denominational fellowships of lower social standing, which for many decades had been a major source of membership growth. But the decline was much too rapid and extensive to be explained by the drying up of this crucial source. <clears throat> the Methodists, having reached their all-time high in 1964, were down by 9% <clears throat> 11 years later, and by the early 21st century, the Methodists had declined by 28%. Episcopalian membership peaked in 1967, and only eight years later was down by 9%. The Presbyterians declined by 19% between 1965 and 1975. <clears throat> Why a decline of this scale and at this time? 
Not because masses of believers switched from the liberal churches to the conservative ones, although some people did just that. The migration to evangelical churches was actually not large and was actually smaller even than the modest migration to Roman Catholicism. What then does explain the sudden and sharp decline in membership of the old mainstream churches? Well, the central factor was the decision of children of members <clears throat> not to become members themselves. Some of these young people adopted other religious affiliations, but the great majority of the departing youth did not affiliate religiously at all, and in turn raised secular children who, like their 1960s parents, did not join any churches. The significance of the non-retention of ecumenical children was heightened by another condition, a differential birth rate. During the great baby boom, Presbyterian women produced only an average of 1.6 children, while evangelical women produced an average of 2.4, considerably more than even Catholic women produced during the same period. <clears throat> Educational level was the strongest predictor of fertility. Some evangelical women were fully as well educated as their ecumenical and secular counterparts, but most were not. Not only did ecumenical women bear fewer children, but their churches contained fewer and fewer women of childbearing age. In 1957, only 36% of Lutherans were over the age of 50. But by 1983, this figure had gone up to 45%. During the same 26 year span of time, the percentage of Methodists over the age of 50 increased from 40 to 49%, and of Episcopalians from 36 to 46%. <clears throat> The evangelical triumph in the numbers game from the 1960s to the early 21st century was mostly a matter of birth rates, coupled with the greater success of the more tightly bounded, predominantly southern evangelical communities in acculturating their children to ancestral religious practices. Evangelicals had more children and kept them. This demographic dynamic had obvious cultural foundations. The rapidity <clears throat> An extent to which ecumenical women took advantage of birth control technologies is consistent with their greater recognition of a role for sex beyond procreation, just as the propensity of ecumenical youth to fly the coop was facilitated by their greater exposure to a diverse world and by the greater encouragement of their elders to explore it. The political coordinates of the ecumenical evangelical divide need to be underscored in the context of the recent movement of several prominent evangelicals in more progressive directions on some economic and environmental issues. This highly publicized shift within evangelical Protestantism remains contested and is indeed a very recent phenomenon. <clears throat> During the pivotal 1960s and 70s and 1980s and even thereafter, the liberal conservative political divide mapped quite easily onto the ecumenical evangelical divide. The two great parties <clears throat> within American Protestantism were never monolithic <clears throat> and are not now. It will not do to suppose that everyone on one side or the other thinks and behaves identically, but <clears throat> the overall pattern is clear. Relative to evangelicals, ecumenicals have been more accepting of religious pluralism, more comfortable with church-state separation, more sympathetic with anti-racist legislation and judicial rulings, more skeptical of American foreign policy, more supportive of abortion rights, more favorable to the Equal Rights Amendment, more concerned with civil liberties issues, more tolerant of non-marital cohabitation, and more accepting of same-sex relationships. One major <clears throat> quarrel about same-sex relationships is a poignant illustration of the dynamics fateful crisis. The quarrel involved the Methodist youth magazine, Motive. Its readership included many college and seminary faculty of all denominations. Uh, <clears throat> William Stringfellow and Harvey Cox published in its pages. When the magazine's attacks on segregation annoyed Methodists in the southern states, Oxtham himself stood down a group of southern ministers by slamming a stack of copies on a table and claiming to agree with every word in them. In 1966, Time Magazine praised Motive as the literary equivalent of a miniskirt at a church social. <clears throat> Yet in 1972, Motive abruptly, abruptly ceased its 31 years of publication with two provocative and defiant issues celebrating gay and lesbian sexuality. The context in which the editors did this is revealing. <clears throat> 
Methodist leaders found themselves barraged with criticism generated by a motive issue of 1969 on women's liberation. As with so many of the period's efforts to liberate captives, Motive's radical feminist stance threatened to so alienate the church-going base that church officials, who like Oxnum had expended their political credit again and again to defend Motive, felt obliged to call a halt. The Methodist leadership would continue to support Motive only if its editors could find ways to cause less trouble for the church. The editors, of course, refused and pursued it, proceeded all the further in the diversity-affirming directions in which they were already headed which turned out for some years to have included serving as an unpublicized safe harbor for gay and lesbian Methodists. With what little money they had left after declaring their independence from the Methodists, <clears throat> the editors detonated their institutional suicide bomb. One of, the central one of the central figures in this episode later described <clears throat> what the experience meant to her. The more feminist I became, the more impatient I was with the phallocentricity of Christianity, wrote Charlotte Bunch. And with the, I became impatient with the slowness of the institution to see how it oppressed women. Bunch left the Methodist Church because she was simply not willing to be affiliated with an institution that labeled me a sinner and denied me the right to enter the highest callings of the church. While the editors of Motive went their own post-ecclesiastical way, <coughs> exemplifying the difficulties of ecumenical leadership and holding on to its young, the National Council of Churches tried desperately to keep up with the times. Between 1972 and 1975, the National Council, beyond its adamant opposition to the war in Vietnam, supported Palestinian independence from Israel, endorsed the resumption of normal relations with Cuba, put money and legal resources behind the United Farm Workers Union, rallied to the support of the American Indian movement during the siege at Wounded Knee, and took sides with Soviet-backed African insur uh, insurgents against Portuguese colonial regimes. These steps failed to stem the youth exodus, <clears throat> but they further alienated the council's church-going base. In the dozen years after 1975, the budget of the National Council declined by 53%. Between the late 1960s and the late 1980s, the size of its staff declined by 68%. Local congregations and denominational boards became increasingly wary of the council's leadership. Here, more immediately than in the decline of membership numbers, we see the consequences of the leadership laity gap. Efforts to retain the confidence of the National Council's own denominational constituencies were constantly undercut <coughs> by attacks from the evangelical right, to which the national press paid increasing attention. In 1983, the Reader's Digest and CBS News' 60 Minutes gave a sympathetic ear to critics who said the National Council of Churches is in the pocket of lobbyists for minority groups, and it has substituted revolution for religion, and that it was financing Marxist-Leninist projects throughout Africa and Asia. In the meantime, <clears throat> the evangelicals continued to enact their part of the fateful dialectic. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, Nazarene leisure, James Dobson and others developed family values as a rallying cry for evangelicals who had previously been less engaged than the ecumenicals with debates over the nature of the Christian family. Precisely at the time that the Christian family commissions of one ecumenical denomination after another pulled away from the old uncritical assumption that the traditional patriarchal nuclear family was God's will, the evangelicals latched onto this idea and ran with it. As historian Margaret Bendroth has explained, <clears throat> evangelicals became pro-family largely as a way of asserting their claims to leadership of the society as a whole, determined no longer to be outsiders. Moreover, exactly at the time, that the ecumenicals were dealing anxiously with the consequences of the risks they had taken during the civil rights era, <clears throat> the evangelicals, by merely acquiescing as a fait accompli in the expansions of the civil rights that many of them had opposed when, their, when the uh, issue was still uh, in the air, they were then, these evangelicals were able to gain credibility as a force in national politics just by accepting these changes. Jerry Falwell's moral majority became a force in the Republican Party. Christianity today surpassed and rapidly outdistanced Christian century in circulation. During his 1980 presidential campaign, 
Ronald Reagan himself famously declared to a convention of evangelicals, I endorse you, playing cleverly on that body's inability to formally endorse his candidacy while turning their applause into exactly that endorsement. Now we are ready to see how all this runs parallel to what happened to the Democrats. <clears throat> at, issue, uh, at issue in the control of American Protestantism was not only race, the crucial issue for the Democrats, but also imperialism, feminism, abortion, and sexuality, in addition to the critical perspectives on supernaturalism popularized by thinkers like Cox and Robinson. Ecumenical leaders were not as aware as Johnson apparently was of the risk they were taking, nor were they as blunt in the moments when the truth dawned upon them. But they, like he, believed that the time had come to redirect the institutions and populations they were trying to lead. Hence, they largely abandoned the classic foreign missionary project of conversion and the powerful claim of a proprietary relation to the American nation. In pursuit of causes they believed to be God-inspired, <clears throat> The ecumenical leaders encouraged secular alliances that blurred the boundaries of their faith community and risked the gradual loss of their children to secular communities. The ecumenical leaders accommodated perspectives on women and the family that diminished their capacity to reproduce themselves exactly at the same time that they took positions on empire, race, sex, abortion, and divinity that diminished their ability to recruit from the ranks of evangelicals new members who might otherwise have found it congenial to become an Episcopalian. Further. Just as Lyndon Johnson and the National Democrats could not contain Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Freedom Democrats in 1964, <clears throat> the ecumenical leaders could not contain the self-consciously progressive forces exemplified by the editors of Motive. But the domain of the Mississippi Freedom Democrats and their kind was ultimately the nation, not the South. Such radicals could return to their party after its need to placate white Southerners was decisively diminished. Indeed, they were obliged to do so just because in the absence of a new political party, that was the only way to remain active in national politics. By contrast, <clears throat> the captive liberating and supernaturalism rejecting projects of the editors of Motive and their counterparts could be advanced without any kind of Protestantism uh, whatsoever. The radical progeny of the ecumenists had less incentive to return to their party. So what if Protestantism fell increasingly into the hands of the other party? That mattered only if one continued to believe that the Christian religion was ultimately the most viable foundation for the kind of society that ecumenical Protestant leaders had come by the 1960s to advocate. The belief in the indispensability of Christianity, while regarded as a conceit by secular thinkers and adherents of other religions, had long sustained even the most liberal of the ecumenical Protestants in their worldly activities and helps to explain their complacency. But this belief in the unique contribution to Christianity to the world lost its hold <clears throat> on many followers of Niebuhr, Smith, and Cox, <clears throat> all of whom had still believed in it. Christianity became only one of a number of valuable vehicles for values that transcended the ancestral faith. Children of the old Protestant establishment found that Christianity was not so indispensable to the advancement of the values most energetically taught to them by their Methodist and Congregationalist tutors. But secular alliances were not new for ecumenical Protestants and in the past had not been so dangerous for them. Why was it different this time? The drift to post-Protestantism was more pronounced in the 1960s and after because of the novel ethno-religious demography of that era. <clears throat> Jews were much more prominent in American civil life in the 1960s and after than they had been in the Progressive Era or in the 1930s. The leading secular intellectuals of the 1960s were much less grounded in a Christian past than their predecessors had been. The greatest secular philosopher of the first half of the 20th century, John Dewey, after all, was a lapsed Congregationalist and had actually engaged religious issues rather than ignored them as irrelevant to serious intellectual inquiry. And in the world beyond the North Atlantic West that the ecumenists engaged, non-Christians were much more empowered in the 1960s and were in charge of many enterprises in Africa and Asia. In this setting, countless individuals who inherited the traditions of ecumenical Protestantism put their energies into an imposing collection of secular agencies, including the human rights organizations that flourished in the 1970s and after. These post-Protestant endeavors are a major feature of modern American life. Yet our recognition of them has been obscured by a survivalist bias, by which I mean a preference for, if not a commitment, to the survival of Christianity. From a Christian survivalist point of view, <clears throat> the key questions about ecumenical Protestantism are first, 
whether it had been able to perpetuate itself on its own terms, and second, whether it has advanced the Christian project effectively or contributed to the actual weakening of that project. These questions dominate the existing scholarly and popular literature, and they reflect the religion-protecting outlook of the Lilly Foundation, which has funded most of the scholarship on the destiny of ecumenical Protestantism. The ecumenical leadership's tolerance of diversity and openness, <clears throat> write Wade Clark Roof and William McKenney, tended to erode loyalty to the inherited religious order and ultimately spawn many secularists among its own progeny. Mainline, Protestant mainline Protestantism's emphasis on inclusiveness and diversity made it function rather like a sieve, as Roof and another of his Lilly-supported collaborators put it. This figure of speech <clears throat> is typical of commentators who suggest that if only the ecumenists had more vigorously acculturated their youth and maintained tighter organizational discipline, things might have turned out more favorably for the churches. This survivalist perspective misses a reality to which this address has drawn attention. The historic function of self-interrogating ecumenical Protestantism as an environment in which many Americans found themselves able to sympathetically engage a panorama of ethno-racial, sexual, religious, and cultural varieties of humankind. The ecumenical leadership, <clears throat> as it engaged the diversity of the modern world, enabled their community of faith to serve among its other roles as a commodious halfway house to what, for lack of a better term, we can call post-Protestant secularism. To recognize this is in no way invidious, unless one approaches history as a Christian survivalist. Religious affiliations, like other solidarities, are, after all, contingent entities generated, sustained, transformed, diminished, and destroyed by the changing circumstances of history. Those circumstances still render ecumenical Protestantism a vibrant and vital home for many persons. A genuinely historicist approach to history will not teleologically predict the future of any community of faith. Once this historic function of ecumenical Protestantism is recognized, however, it becomes possible to see <clears throat> that ecumenical Protestantism actually advanced some of its central goals even while its organizational hegemony dis disappeared. The diversity preoccupied aspects of American life today look much more like what the editors of the Christian Century in 1960 hoped it would look like than what the editors of Christianity today were then projecting as an ideal future. Ecumenical letter leaders may have lost American Protestantism, argues N.J. Demarath III, but they won the United States. The ecumenists campaign for individualism, freedom, pluralism, tolerance, democracy, and intellectual inquiry, observes Demarath exactly the liberal values that gained rather than lost ground in the public culture of the United States in the second half of the 20th century. These values were not peculiar to ecumenical Protestants, <clears throat> but the latter's emphatic advocacy of these values enacted ecumenical Protestantism's historic accommodation with secular liberalism. These values served as key justifications for many of the transformations of the 1960s and have been invoked since that time in countless specific contexts as the United States has confronted massive immigration from non-European lands and has sought to find ways to do justice to the descendants of its enslaved and conquered peoples. What Demarath calls <clears throat> the cultural victory of ecumenical Protestantism is easily exaggerated. But so too is the political victory the Democrats achieved by abandoning the South. American politics as a whole are massively influenced even today by the conservative Republicans of the states of the old Confederacy. And the great authority exercised today by politically conservative evangelical Protestants in the US Senate and Congress bespeaks no victory for Reinhold Niebuhr and G. Bromley Oxnum. Yet one domain in which Demarath's hyperbole has impressive credibility <clears throat> is religion itself. Two leading sociologists report that young adults of virtually all varieties of faith now talk like liberal Protestants. Included in this company, insist Christian Smith and Patricia Snell, are white evangelicals. Smith and Snell declare that Harry Emerson Fosdick would be proud to hear <clears throat> today's religious banter because even the white, angel white evangelicals, grandchildren of the people who so resented Fosdick's dominance on the airwaves of the 1940s, were now paraphrasing passages from the classic liberal Protestants like Fosdick. The liberal ideas <clears throat> developed at Andover Union and Harvard have trickled down at last, but not all of them. The commitment to diminish inequality that mattered so much to Wilfred Cantwell Smith 
and so many other ecumenists of old is not so abundant in the cheerful tolerance and diversity talk discovered almost everywhere by today's sociologists. If younger rank and file evangelicals <clears throat> have adopted many of the ecumenist perspectives on religion as such, why are liberal political opinions still so decidedly a minority in evangelical circles? <clears throat> Our era's most distinguished political sociologist, Robert Putnam, and his collaborator, David Campbell, believe they have the answer to this question. <clears throat> the popular association of religion with right-wing politics as consolidated during the Reagan era by evangelical entrepreneurs was highly successful, but appears to have diminished the appeal of religion for anyone who is not comfortable with such a politics. There are fewer and fewer political liberals in any church and fewer and fewer political conservatives outside the churches. Religion has always had a political matrix, but in the United States of the 21st century, religion may be in the process of becoming more epiphenomenal. Putnam and Campbell argue that political opinions are exercising more and more control over decisions about religious affiliation. As religious pluralism reigns and doctrinally based distinctions between persuasions diminish, <clears throat> political distinctions become more powerful determinants of religious affiliation rather than demonstrable results of such affiliations. Secularization by stealth. But however we assess the contemporary scene and however we may speculate about the future, certain historical realities ought to be clear. The evangelicals gained the upper hand <clears throat> in the struggle for control of Protestantism just as the Republicans gained the upper hand in the struggle for political control of the South. In both cases, the triumph was facilitated by the decisions and actions of the rival party. This analogy, like any, can be carried too far, but just as the nation got something, from the, something in return for the Democrats' loss of the South to the Republican Party, so too did the nation obtain something in return for the ecumenist loss of Protestantism to the evangelicals. The United States got a more widely dispersed and institutionally enacted acceptance of ethno-racial, sexual, religious, and cultural diversity. This sympathetic engagement with diversity that has become so visible and celebrated a feature of public life of the United States is the product of many agencies, but prominent among them are the egalitarian impulses and the capacities for self-interrogation that ecumenical Protestant leaders brought to the great American encounter with diversity during the middle and decades of the 20th century. Those impulses and capacities created a cascade of liberalizing consequences extending well beyond the diminishing domain of mainstream churches running through the lives and careers of countless post-Protestant Americans distributed across a wide expanse of secular space. A compelling emblem for this ongoing process, with which I will conclude, <clears throat> is a decision made by the YMCA in 2010 in view of the vibrancy and diversity of our organization, the Y declared in an important uh, notice to all its members, in view of the vibrancy and diversity of our organization, it dropped the word Christian from its label. Henceforth, it will be known simply as the Y. To be sure, in small print, the organization's materials declare that its mission is to put Christian principles into practice, but here an organization that began in the 19th century as fervently evangelical, then in the 20th century became increasingly ecumenical and egalitarian, has in the 21st century proclaimed itself to be virtually secular and in the name of diversity. Thank you for the honor of being your president.